Hi, and welcome to the inaugural Dr. Podcast episode. Uh, my name is Dr. Robert Seichert. I'm an ophthalmologist practicing in New York City for many years, and I'm pleased to host the inaugural podcast of Dr. Podcasts. Uh, today, I'll be interviewing Dr. Mark Steele, who's one of the top uh, pediatric ophthalmologists in the USA and the world. Uh, Dr. Steele and I are both clinical associate professors of ophthalmology at the NYU Grossman uh, School of Medicine here in uh, New York City. Uh, this is the first doctor podcast broadcast. In the future, I'll be interviewing many other doctors and healthcare experts and professionals, and we hope to have a very informative as well as an entertaining uh, podcast. Uh, today, it's my distinct honor to interview Dr. Mark Steele. Now, Mark, I've heard there are rumors that you've turned down several Joe Rogan invitations. So I'm really honored and privileged for you to be here. And just to introduce you, I want to tell the audience that uh, you're one of the leading pediatric ophthalmologists in the USA and the world. You've done about 20,000 astounding surgeries. Uh, for kids who have crossed eyes or strabismus, uh, which is very amazing. And you're also the founder of Pediatric Ophthalmic Consultants, which is the largest private practice pediatric ophthalmology group in the entire world. So thanks very much uh, for coming today. Um, the I know you have a very busy schedule, so we'll we'll try to get as much information from you in, in a short period of time, and I appreciate you coming here today. Uh, one of the things that pediatric ophthalmologists talk about is strabismus. Uh, that's another term for uh, what's done in pediatric ophthalmology. Can you explain that to us, what strabismus is? Absolutely. First, let me say thank you for letting me be the first podcast uh, interviewee. I am truly honored. I appreciate it. Um, and the other thing I just wanted, just a, a note of clarification. Yes, I turned down Joe Rogan a couple of times, but I am scheduled to be on Megan Kelly's podcast soon. So as it turns out. Say hello to Megan, uh, I'm an old friend. Um, but, but kidding, unfortunately. Um, right, so strabismus. <clears throat> I've dedicated several decades of my career concentrating mostly on children and adults who have misalignment of the eye. Strabismus just means any ocular misalignment. It could be in the horizontal plane where a child or adult will have cross eyes called esotropia or wandering out eyes called exotropia or vertical deviations of the eyes, hypertropia. And there are some individuals who have torsional, a tilting of one eye relative to the other. Strabismus is important uh, to treat early on, uh, particularly in children. Uh, our two main concerns with strabismus is, number one, um, over time in a child who has cross eyes, the eye that does most of the crossing will often start losing vision. The truth is that children aren't born with 20-20 vision. They learn how to see 20-20 in their first years of life by getting clear stimulation through each eye into the brain. And the brain learns what 20-20 clarity is all about. If a child has a cross eye and say the right eye is crossing more than the left, uh, if the child were old enough to read the eye chart, they wouldn't see so well in the right eye, even with eyeglasses on. So that's reversible if you catch it early, and, uh, um, and that's one reason we're concerned about strabismus and, and why we want to treat it early. The other is early in life, when a child's eyes are straight, they learn 3D vision, depth perception, what we call binocular vision. And if the eyes are crossing, that learning process is not occurring. And if we let it go too long and eventually straighten the eyes, say with surgery, which we could talk about later if you have any questions about that, but uh, correct it with surgery, they still may not have the 3D vision. But if you capture it early and treat it early, you could restore the normal pathways in the brain for depth perception. And if I could say one more thing that's a benefit of correcting strabismus or why we should address it, it's been shown over and over again with multiple studies that, for example, adults who uh, are applying for a job, uh, if their qualifications are the same as a, a fellow job applicant, but this individual has a crossed eye or a wandering eye, they don't get the job. 
<clears throat> so just social interactions, even for little children, it's it's not the same if somebody you're talking to doesn't know where you're looking. Right. So, so some people say it's a cosmetic issue, but it's really more a functional problem. So it's very important to correct the eyes as early as possible, as young as possible in children and, and keep them straight. And I mentioned earlier that you've done about 20,000 of these uh, eye muscle operations, which is amazing. Is there any other way to treat strabismus or eye turns or crossed eyes other than with surgery? Fortunately, yes. Uh, sort of the theme in our field, the pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus for children and adults is to avoid surgery if we can, uh, and we often can. I'm sort of a, was, has been, have been in sort of a tertiary care environment where, you know, when the decision is made to have surgery, they end up on my doorstep. So I have a skewed view of things where people come in who are, that's the only way to go as surgical candidates, as a surgical candidate. But yes, there are uh, many children, in fact, most children who have strabismus and even adults as well uh, who have double vision, there are things we could do with glasses that we can repair the problem. So the most common type of crossing, fortunately, is a child is normal child, happy, healthy, everything's fine. And all of a sudden, at age 18 months, two years, two and a half years of age, their eyes start to cross. And generally in those kids, it's just a warning sign that they need glasses. Most kids are farsighted, as you know, right. uh, and normal. it's normal to have farsight as a child. For an adult who's farsighted, they can see far away, they're sighted for far, and they can't see well up close. Adults who are farsighted, and they need reading glasses. But children who are farsighted, they can uh, easily, subconsciously exert a little effort or neural input to focus the eyes, stretch a little muscle behind the pupil, that makes the lens of the eye, the clear structure behind the iris, behind the pupil, uh, a little fatter, and that, in effect, uh, focuses the eye through the farsightedness. So children normally are farsighted, and normally they don't get glasses. However, these children that I mentioned that cross their eyes, they come in and we measure their degree of farsightedness, which pediatric ophthalmologists are equipped to do, right. and we see they're much more farsighted than the average child, and it makes sense then that if we put on a pair of farsighted glasses, they no longer have to exert that effort to focus. And the problem is when they exert that effort to focus without glasses, their eyes cross. There's a convergence or crossing uh, that it results, which is not good to have. So it's very important to check children early on to see if they need glasses or not, because sometimes the glasses may be causing the eye turn. Yes, and fortunately, the technology is such nowadays that the pediatricians could do that and they don't have to come to the ophthalmologist for the most part right. to check for eyeglass issues even before the child's able to read an eye chart. Right. It's very interesting. I've noticed in my practice, even though I don't specialize in pediatric ophthalmology, I do see occasional kids for other types of eye problems. And sometimes I see families where several kids in the family have an eye turn or a crossed eye. So is, is strabismus or crossed eyes a genetic trait or is it just a familial trait? How would you uh, explain that? Uh, the way I like to answer that question is, I just from experience in our group practice, there's 12 of us who practice pediatric ophthalmology. We take care of a, a, a population and, uh, in, in the New York area where routinely the families will have eight to 11 children. Wow. And um, we have families that come in where all 11 children have the same strabismus. And then clearly there's a genetic component, right? Um, our group calls it our annuity families, you know, that <laughs> just keep e coming. Elon Musk must love those families because, <laughs> you know, he's in favor of having lots of kids. I, I, I agreed. Um, but in those cases, it's the same parents, you know, maybe a little different from Elon's situation, but. Um, anyway, um, but there are also families of 11 children where only one of those kids has the strabismus. Right. And nobody else in the family, immediate family, extended family, has any misalignment of the eyes. And uh, so clearly that's not a genetic play, right? It's just one of those things hmm. that happens. So we see strabismus in kids who are happy, healthy, neurologically, intellectually intact, but the mechanism, what causes this, is there's a little imbalance in their brain, healthy brain otherwise, 
in the alignment center of the brain, for lack of a better term, right. that's a little off. And as a result, the eyes cross or drift apart. Maybe there's some genetic component, component and environmental factors that may be contributing to it. Hard to say. Hard to say, but clearly in some kids, it's clear-cut environmental. Kids with cerebral palsy or uh, extreme prematurity of birth, right. uh, they have some neurologic issues and, and they have a high, high incidence of strabismus. Right. Mm, fascinating. You know, I'm always fascinated by my colleagues who are in different specialties, uh, why they decided to become doctors. Mm -hmm. So so why did you decide to become a doctor and a physician? <clears throat> I think it dates back to when I was 12 years old. Well, yeah, in the early 70s. Uh, a year or two prior to that, my little brother, five years my junior, won a goldfish in a carnival event. And he brought it home. We got a nice tank for it and filtration. And he really cared for it at, at his age, at age seven and eight and so forth. It came down with this disorder of uh, like a degeneration, like I think they called it back in those days, ick or something of the right. caudal fin of the, of the back fin. And it was eating away at its, at, at its fin. And it just got worse despite putting the ick medicine in the, in the tank. Um, so it wasn't doing well and things were getting worse despite medicine. And I decided to fish it out with a net, the fish, wrap it in a washcloth, a wet washcloth. And with scissors and tweezers, I excised the icky part of the caudal fin and then put the fish back in the water. And part of it actually regenerated uh, and it never came back. And the fish lived for another six or seven years in that tank. Wow. And when I did it, I remember getting a lot of praise from my parents and certainly respect from my little brother. Um, and I always liked, tinkering and doing things with my hands. And I said, you know what? Back in those days anyway, being a physician, there's like some prestige attached to it, unlike maybe today in some instances. But I thought, you know, I could do this. I'm a math science kind of guy and I like tinkering. Maybe I could be a surgeon someday. That's a fascinating story. which actually leads to my next question. I was going to ask you why you became an ophthalmologist and then a pediatric ophthalmologist. Did you do eye surgery on that fish also? <laughs> yeah, no. No, no. And it wasn't a child when I did it. So neither one. Wow. So why did you become an ophthalmologist and then a pediatric ophthalmologist? By the way, how, how many years of training post-college does it take to become a pediatric ophthalmologist? As, right. So our audience uh, knows. Well, audience, um, uh, the uh, pathway to becoming a, a pediatric, say, ophthalmologist is after college is after college, there's four, uh, four years of medical school, four years of residency training in ophthalmology, and then anywhere from one to three years of post-residency training or fellowship in strabismus surgery, which I did my fellowship in in pediatric ophthalmology, it was one year. So I guess that adds up to nine years of uh, post-graduation from college effort. You know, people say their 20s is a great decade, you know, from a social standpoint and having fun and all this. To me, it was a lost decade. I just remember studying and learning and working hard and all, uh, but no regrets. That's, a, that's great. Similar for me. I also went to medical school, then a year of medical internship, then three years of ophthalmology residency. Then I'm a cornea specialist, as you know, so I did an extra year of cornea fellowship training. But uh, it's all uh, worthwhile at the end of that long road. So that's good. Um, you know, I'm always fascinated. I do see some kids in my practice for, for other issues, but you're seeing primarily almost all kids with some adults who have eye turn problems. Um, I'm always fascinated by how pediatric ophthalmologists can efficiently see kids and examine them and treat them. Because when I examine very young kids, it's sometimes difficult to examine them because they don't necessarily sit still. They don't want to cooperate. They're afraid of the equipment. Yet you guys seem to have figured out a, a system to do that efficiently and effectively and, and help these kids and their parents. What's the secret sauce for pediatric <laughs> ophthalmologists? I think one of the primary or one of 
the ingredients of that sauce is just the initial encounter when the child and parent comes into the office. Receptionist has to be cheery and happy uh, and receptive, as the name receptionist implies. Right. And um, uh, the office itself has to have lots of toys and videos and places to run around. It's always been an issue here in the New York City area is getting large office spaces for right. that reason. And um, our technicians who first ask questions of the parents and, and uh, uh, do some parts of the exam with the child are all very talented, child-friendly, camp counselory, but very bright and well-trained uh, in pediatrics. So immediately the child's kind of feeling that, yeah, maybe this isn't so bad. Um, when I walk into the room for the first time, and we have a big room where we can accommodate both parents, siblings, grandparents, again, for a comfort reason for the child, um, it's all upbeat. Uh, and hello, nice to meet you. I don't say I'm Dr. Steele, because that's already a, 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 a bad thing to say in front of a child. I just say my full name. And, uh, um, and then I assess right away. This is the hardest thing, as you know, uh, being a physician is seeing 30, 40 or more patients a day. In our office, one of the docs, the record is 90 patients in a day, which in is a starting day. early in the morning, ending, ending late at night, but is assessing the person that you're about to examine who you haven't met before or you haven't seen in a while uh, and understanding where they're coming from, the intelligence level, their anxiety yeah. level, and so forth. And with, same with the child, you got to kind of feel what they can tolerate. And, you know, I wear down a lot of my slacks because um, I get on my knees on the carpet and I start playing with them. I look at a toy that they have and I talk about the toy. And as I'm doing that, I, either, if they're still a little upset, I'll talk to the parent. Just having a calm conversation with the parent goes a long way in gaining the child's trust. So it's establishing a, a certain environment that yeah. makes the child super comfortable, yes. almost like your friend instead of a doctor or patient. It's a play date. Yeah. It's a play date. I yeah. love that. And the goal, is that awesome. the goal is that I want them to leave the office not realizing that they had an eye exam. Right. Yeah. And then saying, I want to go back and see Dr. Steele right. again. Right. So our little right. microscope that you have in an ophthalmologist's office where you slit lamp, where you, right. the, the child puts his chin or her right. chin and the forehead for it's a bicycle. They're holding onto handlebars. They got the helmet on. We have videos going in the office so they could look far away and toys to look at up close objects while we measure strabismus and other things. Interesting you say that because I've had patients who've seen you, very young patients, little kids, and then I see them for some other reason, some other eye problem. And I go, did you see Dr. Steele? They go, yeah, I love Dr. Steele. I want to go back there again. Right. So that's great. The other thing that fascinates me about pediatric ophthalmology, I mostly see adults, so it's a one-to-one -one interaction with, with the patient. With pediatric ophthalmology, you not only have to interact with the patient, the child, but also with parents who are anxious and concerned and worried and nervous, especially uh, if surgery is is a possibility. So uh, I think you have to kind of be a psychiatrist almost with the parents in addition to the pediatric ophthalmologist with the child. Is, is that right? In fact, yes. Um, the first day of my last year of training in pediatric ophthalmology, my mentor wisely told me, said, Mark, uh, this year, 90% of what you're going to learn is psychiatry. <laughs> Uh, you know, how to talk to parents and, and relieve their appropriate anxiety. Right. You know? um, yeah. Well, that's, that's pretty fascinating. Um, now, I've had uh, adult patients who come in to see me for various problems, and they just mentioned to me that they noticed that one of their kids has an eye turn or a crossed eye, and I tell them, well, they should be examined by a pediatric ophthalmologist, and I often refer them to you if they live in the area. Uh, many of them, or some of them sometimes tell me, you know, the pediatrician said, oh, just wait, they'll grow out of it, or they know some other doctor who said, oh, don't worry about it, it, it goes away. Um, I know that's bad information and, and incorrect. Can you explain why that's bad information? Right. That's a leading question, by the way. Um, it is. <laughs> it's misinformation. It actually is and it isn't. And let me explain that okay. from my perspective. But yeah, 
overall, it's bad information. But early in life, the first six months of life, it's quite common that a child will have some intermittent variable drifting of the eyes. My son at two months of age, all of a sudden the eye would go out once in a while when he's tired, then it would come back in. And it wasn't a fixed, constant misalignment of the eyes. And this little intermittent variable is normal for the first six months. So we don't get too excited unless there's a constant significant crossing before six months, because it often does go away. But after age six months, there shouldn't even be an occasional drifting of the eye. That has to be investigated. Um, the reason being is, as we described with binocular vision development and amblyopia, losing vision in one eye, if we don't capture that early and start treatment, uh, often with glasses or patches or sometimes surgery, uh, we, we lose uh, potential uh, good outcomes for these kids. But importantly, uh, there could be some really serious sight or life-threatening issues that arise or present with a strabismus early in life. For example, um, if, you, if you ride mass transit as I do on a subway car, if I look around in a, in a, uh, on a crowded day in, on rush hour and subway, there's usually at least one person with an eye that drifts out like this. Our, and in adults who have poor vision from a previous eye trauma or this amblyopia we talked about or a cataract that was never taken care of or retinal detachment or end-stage glaucoma in one eye, it tends to drift out. While a child has a serious eye vision issue, the eye tends to go in. And there's um, uh, uh, the kids could get cataracts or have the dense amblyopia, and it, the crossing could be the first sign of that. And you, you want to address that early, as we discussed. The other thing is uh, this, uh, a type of eye cancer called retinoblastoma. And I've had a few cases o over the long uh, uh, career I've had that came to me just for crossed eye. And, and sure enough, I look in the eye and I'm like, oh my God, you know, and, and catching that early is life life-saving. Life so something not to neglect. Right, that's an important message. It's very rare, but occasionally yeah. an eye tumor or even eye cancer can present as an eye turn. So after six months, it's, it's best not to ignore it uh, and get it checked out by a pediatric ophthalmologist. That's great. I mentioned earlier that you have the, the largest uh, pediatric ophthalmology group in the USA, if not the world, private practice. And uh, you start out as a single doctor. Now you mentioned you have 12 uh, other pediatric ophthalmologists in your group. How did you manage to, uh, to do that, to build such a huge pediatric ophthalmology empire? No idea. No, actually, <laughs> no, really no idea. Just um, luck. It just so that's, that's it. I, into clearly it. luck and maybe divine intervention uh, was a big uh, part of it. But it helps. It does. Never hurts. So, um, right. So when I started practice in New York City and kind of hung up the proverbial shingle and said, okay, I'm, I'm here. Let me see patients. For some reason, people came to see me, right? They were referred by, by their pediatrician or my colleagues in ophthalmology. And particularly now more than ever, the mommy to mommy network of uh, you know, neighborhood blogs and, 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 and so forth, um, it's very potent and a, a great way to build a practice. So what would happen is after a year or two of practicing, it got so busy that I couldn't accommodate everybody who wanted an appointment. So we'd bring, I brought on another doctor and then in a year or two, the same thing happened to, to her. And, and so on and so forth. So each time we got overbooked, we would look for more help and demand um, excellence, not only of right. our staff and of our beautiful offices, which I'm very proud of, um, but obviously the physicians, right? So the main um, criterion for acceptance into my practice is that the new doctor has to be smarter than me. And now that's not a high bar, fortunately, so we had a wide pool of, of applic job applicants. But, uh, and that's, it turned out to be the case. I mean, these guys are, and women are, are just brilliant, uh, excellent practitioners, great child-friendly and parent-friendly uh, so physicians. The key word I heard there several times is excellence. If yeah. you provide excellent care, 
um, you're going to attract a lot of people. And these days with social media, it spreads yes, uh, even yeah. more rapidly. If you have a few parents who are happy, they tell all their other parents. And yeah. But you also have to be all in, right? I mean, if you want to develop something like this, where seven days a week, uh, many hours a day, this is what you're doing, or at least thinking about, and uh, you got to give it that commitment. Uh, it's a great country we live in uh, where you have that opportunity to develop these enterprises and um, if you work hard That's and you great. play your cards right. Now, one of the things about uh, operating on kids that's different in adults, most of the surgery I do, like cataract surgery, LASIK, even corneal transplants, is done under local anesthesia. The patient is awake, but I numb the eye so they don't feel anything, and surgery takes anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour, um, and they're usually very cooperative. With kids, it's different, though. You can't have a two- or three-year-old... Uh, sitting there for surgery. Can you explain what the anesthesia is like for doing eye muscle surgery? Yes, yes. So you're right. I mean, we, we have to have a general anesthetic, right? Uh, but nowadays it's kind of, I, I tell parents, kind of like colonoscopy type of anesthesia where, um, it, and since I started practice, there's been some game changes, two in particular, actually, yeah, two in particular, three, I should say. Number one, pediatric ophthalmologists. None of my partners or myself will go into an operating room unless it's a pediatric anesthesiologist. When I first started, they were virtually non-existent. There was right. a few here and there. So that's, there's been a big proliferation of pediatric anesthesiologists. It's been a tremendous advance for, for pediatric subspecialist surgeons. Um, the second big thing was the advent of one type of inhalational anesthetic called sevoflurane is the technical name. Mm. And sevoflurane just isn't as irritating to the airways. Problem with children is they have a small airway. Their, tr their trachea is smaller, the windpipe is smaller than in an adult. And you got to be real careful with anesthetics uh, that it doesn't constrict or get irritated. Uh, so that agent has changed, been a game changer. And the other is we don't routinely put in endotracheal tubes. And normally if somebody has general anesthetic, the tube, the breathing tube is going into the windpipe, to the trachea. Not anymore. We use what's called laryngeal, as you know, laryngeal mask anesthesia device, LMAs it's called. And it sits above the vocal cords, doesn't involve the windpipe and airways. And so the kids just don't get into these respiratory issues intra and perioperatively anymore uh, for the most part. Um, and so thankfully, uh, you know, we don't see any serious issues. In fact, the, our pediatric anesthesia team, which are crackerjack at NYU, for example, NYU Langone, uh, we work in the ambulatory care or an outpatient surgical facility. On the days that we operate, we have 14 or 15 kids. Like today, we had a, a huge amount of children that we operate on. The pediatric anesthesiologists from our children's hospital, the main hospital, descend onto this ambulatory care center, and they love coming because there, because it's healthy kids, and this is a piece of cake for them. So they tell parents when asked, what are the risks? Is it dangerous? They'll often say, it's more dangerous for you or having a higher risk of adverse things happening to your child getting to the hospital that day in a car or whatever than it is on the OR table. And I totally right. agree with that based on my experience. That's amazing, because I remember when I got started many years ago was general anesthesia with the tube and your windpipe and so on. There were significant risks, and the kids would be irritated. So that, that's a major breakthrough. So it's important for parents to know if you're having uh, surgery done on your kids to make sure there's a pediatric anesthesiologist available and, and doing the surgery with the pediatric surgeon. Uh, great to know that. Um, can you briefly explain how many eye muscles are there and, and how do they work? Just kind of brief over. Yeah, sure. So there are six eye muscles on each eyeball uh, that sit on the white part of the eye, and they're covered by a clear membrane called conjunctiva. Like you get conjunctivitis, that membrane gets swollen and or infected. But So anyway, these muscles sit on the white part of the eye. There's two horizontal muscles that move the eye inward and outward, and two vertical muscles up and down. And there are also oblique muscles that tort the eye, twist the eye, in addition to some vertical function. Those are the eye muscles. 
But I, I must point out at this point that, you know, people who have misalignment in the eyes, 95% of them, it's not because they have a problem with their eye muscles that's causing the crossing. It's really the way the brain is signaling those muscles that's off or imbalanced. I'm always amazed by the fact that the brain can handle six different muscles in each eye and align them perfectly no matter where you're looking and and what you're looking at it's just there's totally fe there's, amazing there's feedback right so if the brain senses that you're not seeing binocular for a millisecond it'll modulate that and and, and lock it back in that's why binocular vision is important to preserve long-term good alignment because the brain can handle little oscillations over time but then eventually uh some kids, uh, the signals are just so aberrant that the brain can't bring the eyes together. It's uh, incredibly amazing. Sometimes I watch synchronized swimming. And, <laughs> That's right. You know, where the two swimmers are identical, but yet you can sometimes see one of them just move slightly differently. Yet the eye muscles in both eyes, six muscles in each eye are completely, uh, perfectly synchronized. That's why a large part of the brain is devoted uh, to vision. Mm-hmm which is uh, pretty amazing. Um, without getting too gory and too technical, can you explain how you move the muscles around on the eyeball no. and shift their no. position to get the eyes aligned again? So if we can't fix the problem with more sort of simple means, whether it's eye patches, glasses, uh, prism therapy and glasses, uh, uh, sometimes exercises, if appropriate, if we can't do that, the child has to, or adult has to come to the OR and we, we adjust the tension of those innocent eye muscles that are getting abnormal signals to the, from the brain. To compensate for those abnormal signals, we have to either decrease or increase the tension of a muscle. So most of the time it's a decreasing attention. For an example, if a child's eye is crossed in, the, the presumption is the inner muscle is getting too much innervation, too many impulses to tell the eye to pull in too much. So we can't change those impulses, but we could relax the tension of that muscle. So our group at NYU, we use the latest technique, which is microscopic. We go way down here where the pink part meets the white part of the eye, and there's a little, like, little clear membrane, conjunctiva, resides there. We make a microscopic little incision through that membrane, and we tunnel up, and we get to the muscle that's sitting on the white part of the eye. We detach it all with microscopic instruments, including microscopic scissors. We don't use scalpels. And we just move it further back and reattach it at the appropriate amount, given the degree of misalignment there is. Uh, and in doing so, we take this tight rubber band that's pulling the eye in too hard, and we give it more slack. It's just physics, right? And the eye straightens out in the vast majority of patients. And then the brain sees better it's synchronized better and it sends the proper signal to keep it that way right right in a young child that's true it just relearns or we rebooted the hard drive so to speak and it relearns how to lock in and keep the eyes straight so yeah that's right yeah pretty amazing uh some of my adult patients tell me they have kids with eye turns or crossed eyes or strabismus and instead of seeing a pediatric ophthalmologist, they're seeing therapists who do visual training. No. And I tell them, I don't know about visual training. I recommend you go to a pediatric ophthalmologist, my colleague, Dr. Steele. Can you tell us what visual training mm. means, what it is, and does it work? I think it's helpful to define three terms first. Number one is, what's an optician? Optician is a guy or a woman who, who dispenses glasses. You go in, you buy select frames, they grind the lenses and give you glasses. So that's an optician. The next level is optometrists uh, who are uh, excellent at, uh, typically excellent at prescribing glasses. Often they dispense them too, like an optician. They're great with contact lenses and, and basic eye disease screenings and so forth. So we love optometrists. Um, and then there's the Ophthalmologists. Ophthalmologists uh, went to medical school and then they did all this training after and, and, and also on the surgical end of things. Uh, but there's a fringe, a subset of optometrists on the fringe of optometry that are what's called behavioral optometrists or vision therapists. And they'll take any child, say, usually often with a learning issue or a child who has a headache, 
many of the parents, many of the parents, however, before starting the therapy, the vision therapy that you're describing, a visual training, will come to us for a second opinion for us. Should I be doing this therapy? And the child's perfectly normal, eye-wise. So anyway, they go through this $12,000 a year training or whatever, and it doesn't do anything. What we did learn, and this is of interest, uh, kids who have difficulty reading, uh, the Latin derivative of difficulty reading is dyslexia, difficulty reading, right? Um, they, they end up in these guys' offices and they, they do all kinds of things for them to help it along, but it's not an eye issue. It's not even a vision issue. One of my colleagues up at Yale, Gail Shef, 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 uh described uh, with functional MRI scans how kids with dyslexia, it's an auditory processing problem. It's not even a vision processing problem. Really? So it should never be addressed by an eye care professional, right? In fact, the only reme only cure or treatment is remediation, you know, reading tutor at school or privately, uh, extra reading at home with the parents, that's what reverses it. Uh, difficulty reading or learning, not, not vision exercises. There is one misalignment of the eyes, one strabismus entity that responds well to vision therapy. And occasionally we do send our patients who have that or failing our efforts to these uh, behavioral optometrists. And that's called convergence insufficiency. When you and I read, we're looking up close, our eyes are actually crossing in a little bit. They're converging right. together. Some kids and adults can't do that well. And as a result, reading is a little more difficult. But there are exercises that really reverse that and right. within days generally it's pretty pretty amazing actually and we prescribe that type of exercise in the office and if it doesn't work we have them go see the optometrist right so vision training or visual training doesn't cure eye turns or anything no, like that not at all all right um to change the topic a bit there's been a lot of interest in the media and in medicine in general about myopia uh. or nearsightedness i see lots of articles that it's now an epidemic can you tell us some more about that sure uh, particularly during the COVID era you know we we saw a huge spike in myopia uh, onset in terms of earlier age than normal normally kids until not until they're 9 10 11 will they'll start showing nearsight we're seeing it a lot earlier now and we're seeing it progress or get worse at a high rate to a higher number of uh, prescription and thicker glasses than we normally would have seen in years ago. So what we've learned from all this is this convergence thing we were just talking about when looking up close and doing that for sustained periods of time uninterrupted, that that in itself will cause the eye to become nearsighted. Nearsighted, by the way, for the folks at home, uh, as you well know, and you reverse with your LASIK procedures incredibly well. But um, it's just that the eyeball is too long front to back. So I'm a minus three nearsightedness. That's my prescription. That means my eye is a millimeter too long. You should come over. I'll do I should LASIK go to do LASIK. Right. And I've thought about it, by the way. But the glasses give me credibility. So you evidently. Do look, you do look very professorial. With those, that, that's right? right. So I'm not giving it up. But um, so... Uh, what happens with kids nowadays, if they do, say, for example, during the COVID era, virtual learning, they're staring at the computer all day long. They're not looking at their friend across the room or the teacher at the end of the room or the smart board in the front of the room. They're just focused, converging their eyes incessantly up close. So kids with iPhone, you know, phones and tablet computers and computers, that's all they're doing uninterrupted for hours and hours at a time. And that is causing the nearsighted epidemic, the myopia. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's interesting. Maybe somehow the muscles pulling on the eyeball is causing it to enlarge. It seems that that's, that's the case. Fortunately, now yeah. that we have that insight, there are some things we could do to help it. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about that. Uh, so the one thing is what we call the 20-20-20 rule. Uh, basically, what it means is that every 20 minutes, and we instruct parents and children directly, uh, who are a little nearsighted or a lot nearsighted, or there's a family history of huge nearsighted, to, to consider doing this. And that is every 20 minutes when they're involved in a near vision task, whether it's computer, iPhone, that kind of thing, um, or reading a book, that they take a 20 second break every 20 minutes and look at something far away, like 20 feet away or further uh, for 20 seconds, and then 
do their near vision task for another 20 minutes and then do the same thing again. Take a 20 second break looking far away. That seems to help. Getting some outdoor light exposure may be very helpful. My prediction is at some point, if the ophthalmology lobby in uh, Washington, D.C. or a state level becomes uh, more influential, uh, kids will have to go outdoors in the middle of the day during recess, lunch, or uh, physical education class, even, no matter what the weather is. There's something about blue light that really helps these kids uh, from becoming more nearsighted. The latest rage is is atropine. Right. 32 years ago when I started practice, I had kids who were really rapidly progressive uh, myopes or nearsighted kids. And we at that time, we'd give atropine solution, which is commercially available as a 1% atropine solution. It was great. It worked. The progression wasn't there, but it made the pupil bigger. It made the kids blurry when they looked up close. They had to wear bifocals and sensitive to sunlight. They had to wear transition dark glasses and so forth. It was not worth the effort oftentimes and not tolerated well. Some smart ophthalmologist in Singapore, Dr. Chua, she figured out, let's, start, let's try not 1%, but one-tenth of 1% of atropine. And you know what? It worked better. Wow. In terms of arresting myopia, and it had less side effects, but there were still side effects. Then she said, well, why don't we try one one hundredth of a percent? And lo and behold, it worked the best, better than what? one tenth and one percent, and it arrest you know, it, and it didn't have any side effects virtually. Better than placebo? <laughs> better than placebo. <laughs> uh, yes, and studied well. So now we give 0.01 or 0.02 or 0.05 percent to kids with uh, uh, showing rapid progression, and it works. It's like, it's a miracle. So throughout the world, kids is given out like eye candy, you know. At this point, still not approved by the FDA. Correct, right? correct. But um, but, but there's plenty of studies that show that it's effective and also extremely safe, right? Yes, correct. It's basically water. And it's, you know, atropine has been around for centuries or right. actually millennia right. in ancient Egypt, Belladonna, it was called the women would put it in their eyes to make their pupils bigger, it made them look more trusting or whatever subservient or whatever worked in those days. Right. I've had uh, parents ask me frequently uh, about eye color of their kids. Uh, they notice there's some changes in the first year or so, or they want to know how kids in, inherit eye color. I've had Patients where both parents have brown eyes and, and the child has blue eyes and vice versa. Uh, can you tell us a bit about eye color, what determines it, and yeah. does it change during life? Yeah. So it used to be thought <clears throat> that it was what we call Mendelian inher inheritance. That is, uh, if you remember from an early biology class, for those of you at home, you know, if, if, if both parents are brown eyed, then uh, you're, you're, there's a, the greater chance that your kids will be brown eyed and, and maybe one will be hazily eyed and perhaps even one may have blue eyes, but that's a real uh, unlikely occurrence. But it's not that. It's a polygenic phenomenon. There's multiple genes involved and it's very complicated what will determine the exact eye color. But I can say that for the first uh, year and a half or so, things do change pretty significantly. A blue eyed child becomes darker, brown eyed hazily eye often becomes darker brown eye. It gets darker, never lighter. Right. But by 18 months of age, it's pretty much the color the child will have for a lifetime. Occasionally in the puberty years, we'll see a little darker pigmentation of the iris that causes that, that issue. But as you well know, as an intraocular surgeon, even the brightest blue-eyed patient, they have a dense layer of brown pigment behind right. their iris. And it's just... The iris itself, the, the thickness, the, the layers of the iris isn't, isn't as dense, and we can see that just looking at them under the microscope. And uh, uh, there's some light diffraction and uh, various optical issues that occur where it looks blue, but there's no blue pigment in the iris. It's right. always brown. It's just the question is how much melanin, brown pigment there is uh, in the actual front part of the iris and, and how thick or dense it is. That, Reminds me of a fascinating coincidence I once had. I, I had a parent call me in the office while I'm seeing patients uh, to ask me a question about eye color. And in the background of my office, I sometimes have light music playing. And just as the parent called me to ask about the eye Brown color. Brown-eyed girl? Close. 
Don't it make my brown eyes blue <laughs> by right. Crystal Gale? I said to the parent, can you believe what's playing in the <laughs> That's background? That's incredible. That's an incredible coincidence. And it's also incredible and misinformation, As back to what we were saying before, you can't make brown eyes blue. Right. It doesn't happen. Right, it doesn't. Um, you know, doing the surgery that, that you do uh, requires tremendous skill with your hands. It requires tremendous brain, eye, hand coordination. You're working under a microscope where everything is magnified tremendously. So you obviously uh, have good hands. I understand you use your hands and eye and brain coordination for some other things, hobbies and things. Can you tell us about that? Hmm. Well, it may sound a little crazy, but <clears throat> I'm addicting, addicted to uh, using heavy-duty cutting power tools as a surgeon. Probably not the best idea, but there are multiple, many guys in our profession in ophthalmology that are are uh, woodworkers. You know, they build furniture, and I design and build sort of high-end wood and metal welding furniture and really? uh, have a big shop at home. And yes. So right, I've heard that. that yeah. That's, that's pretty amazing. It's story. like a day in the OR though, as you know, well, doing a million cataracts and other procedures, corny and LASIK and so forth. It's just, it's, it's like arts and crafts. You're there, it's quiet, uh, maybe a little low music in the background and you get into this flow, your brain and it's very relaxing. So, <clears throat> um, I love surgery, I love operating, and I also love being in my wood shop. And at the end of the day, I get this three-dimensional object that I like and cherish and I could give to family, friends, and so forth. So it's good stuff. It's pretty fascinating. So the the eye, hand, brain coordination comes in handy in other things. Sure. I think I inherited that from my father, who was also, he was not a doctor or a surgeon, but he had incredible skills with his hands of what he could do and i i think i picked that up and and that uh, i think evolved into my surgical skills mm. with the training i've had mm. um i also recently heard a rumor from one of our colleagues that that you're also now surfing is Sur that you're taking up well, surfing okay isn't that risky I, I can't believe you're asking that or heard that but um there are a lot of excellent waves out there, really gnarly ones. Um, in fact, this weekend, I look forward actually to uh, going south in our country and on the Atlantic side of Florida and shred some gnar. Really? Yeah. All right. Well, be careful. You don't want to hit, uh, you wear a helmet? No. No? No. All right. Well, just be careful when, when you do that. Thank you. So I, I want to thank you, Mark, uh, very much for appearing today on the inaugural episode of Dr. Podcasts. Uh, I enjoyed tremendously speaking with you, covering all these issues, and I'm sure the audience uh, has as well. And I'm going to be posting this on Twitter, mm. uh, which I hear is becoming the place to go to post uh, video and audio podcasts. It's growing very rapidly, and I think everyone is switching to uh, that environment, so I look forward to posting it. Uh, until the next time, this is Dr. Robert Seichert, and I'd like to thank the audience for listening. We're going to have many other uh, physicians and doctors, healthcare experts, medical experts appearing on Dr. Podcasts, and we hope uh, you'll tune back in on Twitter. Thank you. And thank you. This was great. My pleasure. Thanks very much. The pleasure was mine.